welcome to the August meeting of the BLU. Um, basically, I'm just going to start off and introduce the speaker, Colin Walters, and he's going to talk about GNOME OS and improving GNOME or whatever. And, uh, a bunch of us are going to go to the uh, Cambridge Brewery after the meeting. I've got a hand count uh, before we leave. Oh, yours? Cool. Thanks. Um, so yeah, this is actually my first meeting. i um, been hacking free software in the area for like seven years and just never thought to come. So um, it's actually cool just to, to do some local stuff. Um, okay, yeah, so my name is Colin Walters and um, I'm a little bit of a free software social butterfly. I worked on a bunch of things from, um, started off in Emacs. One of the first patches I did actually was optimizing the bytecode interpreter. Kind of moved into Debian, helped with their PowerPC port. Um, eventually started hacking on Rhythmbox. And uh, if it crashes and it loses your rating data, those stars, yeah, that's because I was a college student. And I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> um, and then I got into GNOME. And um, there's a couple of people that have really inspired me. Probably the biggest is Havoc Pennington. And if you know him, I basically I try and do as much as he does. He's, he's been very inspirational to me. Um, yeah, so I work for Red Hat um, on the client team. Um, so this talk actually, I gave it Guadec, and it was designed for an audience, obviously, of people in GNOME, but I thought it was actually kind of good just to give it verbatim and not change things around because you can see what we were talking about internally, um, or at least some of my perspective on that. So, GNOME, yeah, this is my definition. It's, it's a lot of people, which is honestly. Work on the lights. Let me do the lights. Yeah, I forgot. Yeah. So GNOME has a lot of people, and honestly, the people are really important to me, and I wouldn't be there without it. Like some of the people are really great, and it is actually just a fun project to work in. Um, and obviously, there's a lot of code involved. A lot of code. Um, so. GTK is obviously one of the most important parts of GNOME, and, and I'll, I'll get to that for, for those of you who don't know it. Um, and, and obviously, also over time, GNOME has had a user interface. Many different ones. And of course, pretty much everyone believes strongly in free software, including me. Some people have different motivations. It's very clear, some people, some people just like working in free software, some people are here because they like having their name in lights, <coughs> clearly other people you know, everyone has a mission. So, you know, it's just, it's a lot of people in code. Basically. Now, one of the things that we don't really have, and if you saw um, Benjamin's post, um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, that's fine. But uh, it's basically a, the GTK developer um, was kind of unhappy with the direction we we're taking. But it's true that, um, actually, let me back up. So one of the organizations that I think GNOME should be more like is Mozilla, because I find they're producing something that's entirely free software. It's delivered to people, and people like it, which is great. And there's actually a lot of technical things that they do that we don't, that I'm trying to emulate. But they also have a mission. Mozilla, it's about the open web. And this is the problem is, um, in GNOME, we haven't ever really had that. We know we like free software. We're based on Unix, and okay, what happens there? Well, we don't really have this in Spunk. And of course, we don't have a success metric. Mozilla counts their number of users very well, and they actually have a lot of, a lot of really awesome infrastructure. You know, they'll do the stage rollouts to enthusiast testers and, and get feedback and, and all this stuff. And yeah, we don't have any of that. So there are a lot of problems. Um, how did we get here? Well. The origin of GNOME, and this was actually an LWN, um, coincidentally, for uh, the 15th birthday. Which, um, originally, GNOME was founded because the Qt toolkit was proprietary. And a, couple, a number of people didn't want to base you know, an important part of free software on a proprietary toolkit. So GTK got spun out of the GIMP um, application. Where I kind of came along was around the GNOME 2 era, when Sun came on board. Um, Sun, Sun's involvement signaled a, a, like a maturity in the project that I found very attractive. Uh, it's spe specifically their work in the human interface guidelines. You know, they kind of sat people in front of GNOME, 
uh, to do user, us usability testing and found just some very embarrassing things. And anyways, it became a, there was a number of companies involved and it was, it, it, was, it became a, a maturity point, I think. Yes, there were a lot of preferences removed. Um, Ubuntu was clearly a major event in the history of GNOME. Um, and clearly their moving away from GNOME has been a problem for the project. Um, it kind of sucks, to be, honestly, to be honest. Um, there are a lot of good engineers at Canonical and, well, the reasons behind that are very unfortunate. Um, Fast forward a little bit, uh, you have 10 by 10, Jeff Waz, goal, it's not worth talking about. I was involved in online desktop, which was a complete failure, and um, it actually was a big turning point for me because I realized, well, I realized that it was just, we were regressing things for too many of our users, and it was just, it was just kind of a bad idea, but it was a learning experience. And of course, GNOME 3 generated some controversy, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that too. Okay, but... In the big picture, this is what I just feel lately, is I feel we are successful in free software. And it's actually really awesome how much we've managed to accomplish. In terms of lines of code, influence in the community, yeah, you know, I have a couple parts, bits of code that run in the Android user space. Yeah, I mean, our code's out there, you know, Do clearly dominating in the cloud. But at least, so okay, we have already succeeded. But the problem is, and I, I really feel, too often we go backwards. And there's many reasons for this. Um, but that's my new goal, is simply just to stop the whole thing from going backwards. Okay, so I want to talk about a regression. So this is a great example, and if Jonathan Corbet's humor is just, it's brilliant. If you're not a programmer, the time-space trade-off joke It'll just go over your head, but it's, it's very, very clever, actually. But basically, what he was talking about is, you know, he installed GNOME 2 on some base system, and he had multi multiple monitors, and that worked fine. Then he upgraded to GNOME 3, and when he was trying to use multiple monitors, it broke. The reason for this has to do with limitations of the, uh, the amount of memory in the Intel GPU that he was using. But it doesn't actually matter where a bug is. Like, a lot of people, so many people around me are just obsessed with where bugs go. It doesn't matter. All that matters is his computer broke when he upgraded. That's it. His computer worked fine before, and then it broke. That's a regression. Okay. So on the other side, though, of course, there's a wide degree between these different things. So we, in GNOME, the user, the designers, the developers are going to make changes over time that are intentional, and ideally they've been thought through. We can't just stop progress. So, you know, two, um, two ends, but... <clears throat> so, one of the biggest problems, actually, this is the number one problem that I'm trying to solve, really, is our feedback cycle has sucked. Just forever, basically, um, since I've been involved in the project. Um, so, the people who are using GNOME during the development cycle are people who are building it, they're the developers and the hardcore testers. Um, and kind of everything just happens on individual developer machines. There's, we've tried to have automated builds, I'll get to that in a minute, but even if we had world-class infrastructure, like a project like Mozilla does with, you know, tens of people dedicated to stuff like, uh, they just have so much awesome stuff, I, I'm not even going to go into it. Um, even if we had this though, the problem is, our, what we're building, there's, there's a middleman. So, okay, the middleman is kind of a problem for this model because, so when I was saying that we discovered that the multiple monitors didn't work, that happened, well, mainly because we switched over to GNOME 3, but the point is that at some point software broke because a commit was made. Someone changed the software, right? So. The problem here is that there's often a long lag time before someone can run that. So, in the historical known development process, someone will make a commit in the Git repositories, and then there'll be a series of time before a tarball is made. Now, I've always thought this is insane, but basically, then the tarball is made, and that gets put into a package. But you're still not done because the package has to be assembled into a repository of packages, and 
at that time, then there's some period of time before you actually download it. And then finally, no one runs packages. They run a file system resulting from the installation of a set of packages. So you get a file system, you can boot it, and then you can finally see it. Now the problem is, a lot of, there's just huge lag time in a lot of this. Um, and it's also really tedious. But I'm going to make a claim that I don't think is controversial, but may not be obvious to a lot of you. Uh, it certainly wasn't to me, and it took me a long time to conclude this, is that the semantic for RPM and Debian packages is the version number has to increase over time forever. So what that means is if you get, say, a GNOME settings daemon 340, and then you install GNOME settings daemon 350, the package system will fight you if you try and downgrade. The, the semantic of both AppGit and, you know, the very, basically all these things, at the very lowest level, they want to increase in version number. And it's really horrible to go backwards. If you try, RPM has this thing called Epoch, and Debian, they have this tilde really. So in Debian, you might see a version number 350 tilde really 340. There are a lot of ugly things about this. And I just, I believe this, this semantic where you upgrade and newer is always better, has just strongly influenced our culture. Um, the, in the cur Linux kernel development list, you know, they don't, they're, they're, they will often revert things if they're broken. But it's just very hard to do this with a distribution package model. Now, there are different package systems out there, but, you know, when you're talking about dpackage in RPM, you're talking about almost everyone. And all I'm claiming is that it's very influential in our community. So this stuff I can probably kind of skip, but I've actually spent a lot of my time trying to improve the, um, for people who do want to use GNOME's build system, JSHBuild, I've just spent a lot of time trying to make it more reliable because for a long time, building the code is the only way you could get to see it and ideally change it too. So it, none of these are really important. Just, um, yeah, I've just been working on making the, the JHBuild more, system more reliable. The interesting thing about GNOME's JH build system, are, there are a couple things. First, you get the actual source code. And this, this is another aspect of packages that I've concluded is really bad, is that you're one step removed from the source code. Like, I just believe this is really influential. Like, on my laptop, I have Git checkouts of almost everything, including Firefox. And um, it's just so awesome to have the source code for all this stuff there. And it's... And I'm, by source code, I mean the Git repositories. The packages don't use this. That's a complicated thing. But the point is that JHBuild is designed to contribute. Another one is that it parallel installs inside your distribution. <coughs> if it breaks, if in GNOME we make a commit and something blows up, and you build it, you can still go back to your distribution. All you've lost is disk space and time and electricity flow. Um, it also allows partial builds. So you can say, I want to just see the new Nautilus, and we can kind of make that work. There are a lot of details in this, I won't go into, but you can kind of hack around that. You don't have to build everything from scratch, for example. Um, and it doesn't care whether you're using the dpackage or You've got a question. Kind of, kind yes. of sounds like your complaint is uh, in, in Git, you have you know trees and you basically have graphs and you can, you can move your graphs around, but you're saying that in the uh, packaging system, it's, it's kind of a linear thing. And, That's right. And, well, and so the problem is that we don't have the right graph theory for maintaining distributions. Kind of. Um, <laughs> it, it's, yes. I mean, and I've spent the last year working on a system that's, that's attempting to solve these issues. But, well, okay. Uh, yes, so next slide. So I've made the system called OS Tree. Um, and before I say any more, I'm not, I don't think the system is you know, going to take over the role. Really, it's just a new wrapper for make, and it downloads binaries from the internet. It's the same as dpackage and RPM. Really, the value in these systems is the people behind it. When I, were, when I was in the Debian project, it always amazed me, or it surprised me when people would come up and say, AppGit is so amazing, but it's really just a proxy for human labor. <clears throat> and we have to keep that in mind. It often, we succeed despite our tools. I know a lot of people think, okay, well, you know, my RPM system is amazing or whatever, but really they all, all of them suck in different ways. The point is, we succeed through human labor. So, 
My system just has a different set of trade-offs, but I call it Git for operating system binaries. Now, the interesting thing about it is that you can parallel install things you can boot into um, inside your distribution. So, uh, let me talk to this. Okay. Yeah, so I made a new system. Let me just give you a bit of background. Um, it's really just one step in a long series of things. Um, in Debian, I wrote the CDBS system to try and like improve this. Um, RPM CI was my attempt to automate turning the GNOME Git repositories into RPMs, but the problem with that is that the rollback issue was horrible, and you know you could update and then your system wouldn't boot. It just it wasn't quite right. Um, okay. So I have a couple high-level motivations. One is I find it very deeply embarrassing that both RPM and dpackage, pretty much all the package systems, will just, when you're doing an upgrade, just are deleting files underneath your running system. It's just insane. It's insane. And I've seen many people's system crash because of this, and we just, you know, everyone just thinks it's okay. It's not okay. Um, another one is continuous integration. So. Like I said, I've been trying for a long time to get to a state where when someone makes a commit in GNOME, we can test it. Um, and I've failed many times at this. My current one is the most successful yet, and that makes me very happy. But if I could name one problem that really, honestly, just set me off, it was when um, one of the Fedora QA people, you know, a new GNOME got uploaded into Rawhide, and it broke. I think it was... Um, Something like GNOME said, there was a missing GNOME settings daemon setting, it doesn't matter. And uh, he said, okay, well I install LXD while well, I'm waiting for you guys. Now, I don't think it should be difficult to install LXD, don't get me wrong. But I don't think it should be the path of least resistance. I think it should be easier to debug your system than it is to replace it with something else. Just my opinion. So, I spent the last year, that, that one, yeah, that one really motivated. Okay, so going back to the properties of the system, the neat thing is it doesn't disrupt your distribution. So when you install my system to see the latest GNOME, again, just like GHBuild, you lose nothing except disk space, network bandwidth. Um, but unlike GNOME's GHBuild, my system builds everything from scratch, actually, including all of GNOME, and, and you boot into it, basically. So it, it's a complete isolated system. Um, yeah, and also you download binaries, obviously. Um, one of the interesting properties of this, compared to live CDs and compared to virtualization, is that it uses the home directory of your distribution. So, just to contrast with virtualization, you know, it's obviously a really awesome technology for not destroying your laptop, but the problem is, is that it's really hard to actually use it. You know, so, if you download the latest GNOME, well, you don't have your emails, you don't have your SSH keys, you don't have, etc. It's just, it's not the same thing as actually using it in, in anger, if you know what I mean. You don't have your settings, all that sort of thing. And finally, the coolest part is that when you have one of these systems installed, it's actually pretty easy to get the source code, change it, and then reboot into your modified system. All completely safely, without disrupting your existing distribution at all, and without ex disrupting the, um, the system you booted into. And this is, this is something, if I am successful, I will be expecting people who are consuming GNOME to do, which is a system like this will allow you to bisect across operating system builds. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's basically, you can say, okay, my sound broke sometime in the last week. You can download the series of builds in between there. Each build is associated with a set of git commits. And all you have to do is just reboot at each time, find out which build broke it, and which build contains the set of source code changes. The source code changes contain a list of people, and that's, that's very useful. And yeah, if I'm successful, it's something I will expect people to do, because it's not that painful, actually. I've, I've done it a little bit so far. Um, so, yeah, okay. My system basically takes away the packaging layer. It takes a set of Git, Git um, repositories and outputs file system trees. And there is kind of intermediate steps, but... Hmm, yeah, how to describe this? So, a lot of people will say, okay, I run Debian unstable or something like that. But you don't 
actually run Debian Unstable, you run a subset of the packages in there on a particular architecture. And these details actually start to really matter. So my system is more designed, here's the file system tree that we expect to be running. It lacks flexibility, and I am perfectly fine with that. And actually, the model I'd like to get to is more, again, like Mozilla and what we were trying to do with GNOME Shell, where you have a well-tested core, and you can install extensions on top for the operating system. Um, yeah, so I mean, there are some technical details about this. like. So I maintain all of the equivalent of the percent post, if you're familiar with RPM, basically these shell scripts. Um, one of the interesting things is I built everything from source, and I actually use this well-maintained system by Intel called um, Open Embedded, or Yocto. Um, and it's a cross-build, so my system starts from RHEL 6, and it could even be on a different architecture, cross-builds a build route, and then from there, I switch to my a new build system that I wrote, which is all about continuous integration. So every time a commit is made in GNOME, a file system tree that you can boot into is made. And over the last couple of months, I've been watching this every day and fixing it when it fails. And it's been very useful so far. Um, and trying to do continuous integration with both dpackage and RPM is something I've tried. I won't go into the details of why it failed. I mean, you can kind of make it work, but my system actually makes a couple shortcuts, but the point is continuous integration is really important. So, okay, Alan did a post about this, and like I said at the beginning, GNOME is just people, you know? Everyone has different motivations. My motivation, though, is I do, I think we can greatly improve quality and free software in a number of ways. One, by making updates very safe, more tested, um, and allowing users to do things like bisecting across the bills. But just so people are on the same page, when I say operating system, I mean that you have old binaries you can run. So Windows is a good example of an operating system. You can download, you know, really old programs and they'll run. A distribution is more about packages, so anything can change at any time. There's degrees in between here. Um, this is a good example, though, of something that was a problem when we were doing, trying to do the GNOME 3 release. Uh, Network Manager, the part that controls the wireless networking, change API to, in part, to help uh, us implement a new network interface in GNOME, but the problem is KDE was imported. And then we couldn't ship GNOME, well, we ended up, I think, kind of breaking KDE, but I forget what happened. So, again, I'd love it if we shared source code. That'd be awesome. But the problem is, is that we just can't block on each other. So. If these are actually supposed to be independent projects, we can't have the whole train stop because KDE is imported. So we need a system where the people who want the latest known can try it. Well, still, if you want both or you want a wider world of software, you have the distributions which can be more um, conservative, basically. Uh, these aren't too important, actually. So yeah, basically, there's no security updates for this, and uh, it's just for developers and testers. That's an important takeaway from this. I am taking git commits as they appear in a bunch of, in all of GNOME and just putting them on the internet. That's all that's happening. Um, but I am trying much harder now to institute a code review policy inside GNOME. And it's something we've kind of lacked, so there's a layer of defense, but yeah, there's no security updates. And we really don't have a story for a governance model or branding or anything, how that, how that would work. But the, um, the value here is, is many, and I'm really happy with what the system is doing so far. So the designers have always complained about this in GNOME, is that you know, they say, okay, we want this to be like this, an engineer implements it and they're using JHBuild, now the designer has to go and build everything locally on their system. It just doesn't quite work. Um, and obviously we can say, okay, we know that all the Git repositories in GNOME can be built with this version of GCC, with this XORG, all that sort of stuff you'd expect us to have done over the past 10 years, but no. <laughs> um, and testing. So, yeah, testing will happen. Now, because I'm an engineer and not a marketer, I will happily tell you about the things that suck about my system. Um, one is that there's 
the, the base level system does not guarantee, it doesn't have any notion of source code really. So this is one of the best things about RPM and dpackage is that there's association between the package and the source code it came from, or there should be if it's free software. My system doesn't really guarantee that. You can use any build system you want and just put the binaries in there. Um, and there's actually some shortcuts that I was taking to kind of bypass the packaging level that really do need to be fixed eventually. And the code's barely documented and it's pretty young. So one of the things that I didn't mention actually that I probably should for this group, I, I wanted this talk to be very high level so you can understand my motivations, but the way that the ability to parallel install and bisect across operating systems works is for those of you who know Unix, all the files that are common between them are hard linked and then there's a read only bind mount on top to make it immutable. And the nice thing about this is that if you do an upgrade, it doesn't use any more disk space than the differences between the files basically. And this is implemented by a kind of Git like user space file system. For those of you who don't know, Git really kind of is a file system. File system manager, sort of. So I have something similar, except it's designed for binaries instead of source code. And finally, of course, those of you who are Unix admins know, may have even thought, okay, so you're parallel installing this, a bunch of systems, how do you handle configuration in Etsy? Well, not very well yet. But um, I'm starting to get to a, a point where you can say, okay, I want to change some file in Etsy, uh, I think the example I gave on LWN was the password quality file. You can have that apply to every root that you boot into, but yeah. That actually brings up something I was thinking before is, um, how do you, you, you talked about using the same home directory, yep. um, which means you're now using the same mass of GNOME configuration files in my home directory, right. and I hate whenever I have to go in there and figure out what's going on. I, I, mm -hmm. Maybe I'm not looking in the right place, but like when something breaks, you're saying. Well, yeah, or? just uh, I just want to change something, and I don't know what whether it's even possible because all the various GNOME apps um, don't really doc. My impression is I can never find the documentation for what configuration options there are and where they're mm -hmm. located and what tool to use. Right. And even separate from that, we're talking here about changing versions and. Right. Well, where's the abstraction layer there, which will mm -hmm. cause the things not to conflict with each other? So, I mean, one thing that this a system like this does kind of bring into the foreground is the issue of compatibility between it, it, the yes. settings. Um, but we've actually always had that problem because Red Hat has customers, for example, that use NFS home directories, and so and they boot those between multiple versions of the operating system, um, and that should work. Now. It's actually a very hard code to do. Does it? <laughs> well, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and you want yeah. and you want end users to help you with your debugging. Well, if that well, this is going to expose all of that to them all the time, not That's... just when they upgrade their OS, but whenever they try one of one of these new um, OS images that right. you're talking about. Right, right, right. So that's, yeah, it's a good point. And a, a similar one was raised um, when I gave the talk at Quack. You're right in that the system doesn't provide any safety for your home directory. My suggestion, though, is backups. I mean, you know, I keep everything in Git, personally. But, um, yes, so have backups if you try this, obviously. But, um, and actually, don't, eat, don't try it if you're not a developer, because it's very raw. Um, but to, to answer your question better, I mean, it's, it's been a problem for a long time. I'm not making the documentation any worse, at least. Um, we have gone on a little bit of an effort recently, well, mostly Matthias, to add man pages to things. Um, and the new uh, configuration system, G settings, is actually a lot, it's just a lot better in many ways than GConf was. So, I mean, we still have a lot of stuff in GConf, unfortunately, but yeah, it's an issue. It's an issue. Yeah. Not to go too deep on this, but have you, have you looked at using something like containers and you know, like LXD and Right, you know, all that jazz to try to solve some of this problem. Because yeah. I know this problem is being solved by that even for other some Right. Other um at the core how do how to say this? So the idea of sharing um, data between like operating system trees via hard link is definitely something that they do in the container crowd. 
Because it's the whole advantage of it over virtualization, right? Is if you run a bunch of containers, you only have one copy of libc in memory instead of n, and then you have to deduplicate via KSM or whatever. It's a horrible hack, right? So, yes. And actually, the lowest level of my system does use some of the Linux kernel container features. Um, so, for example, when you're doing an upgrade, I make a new file system tree, and then I actually run the equivalent of the postscripts inside a container type thing. So they can't actually affect your running system. Uh, they're in a new head namespace, for example. They have no networking, and that's, that's sort of cool. So I am using those kernel features heavily, but... Specifically, they're, they're in the midst of solving the slash SD kind of problem. Right. I mean, basically, you, know, yeah. you can have multiple sets of, say, init scripts you know, that, are, that are slightly different right. between right. containers and software collections. To try right. to solve that problem. Right, right. It's clearly, it's a really hard problem actually because basically you have the merge issue. You know, you have the initial configuration file, sample one provided by your operating system, and then you modify it and then it gets updated upstream and then, I don't know. The default, the RPM default just sucks for this. You know, we drop some RPM new files and if you run find in Etsy, maybe you'll, get, you'll see them. I mean, it's terrible. I mean, people have made higher level things on top, so. Yeah, I am not solving that exactly. But it, the one one thing I do want to enable with this system is that you can choose a directory for Etsy when you boot up. So for example, it'd be awesome to boot with no configuration. Just say, give me the default. Again, you lose your wireless networks, but does that matter? Well, you know. Um, yeah, so it's 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 tricky. I I'm kind of hesitant to expose the merge problem to system administrators, but then again. Maybe that's how people do it. You know, Joey Hess wrote Etsy Keeper, which is basically just put Etsy in Git, and uh, he's a really smart guy about that. So, yeah. yeah, sorry, a related question. You keep you don't have it here, but you keep mentioning the action of switching. Do you literally mean reboot, or do you yes. mean restart? <coughs> no. Or? Yeah. So if you read LWN, I kind of had a flame war with um, some guy. I don't even know his name about this. Yes. So I care about safety first. So to, get an, to do an upgrade, I make a complete new file system tree, and then yes, you reboot. Now, obviously, there should be some mechanism to have applications that don't require reboot. But like, what's it? Yeah, so okay, something that I felt is a problem for a long time is the package manager removing Firefox from underneath it. Like, I've had friends that have tried to use Linux, and they saw the little thing that Ubuntu pops up and says your web browser is now broken because you didn't upgrade. And it's just, see, this is the problem, is that in free software we have a lot of amazing things that we do. Again, really cool stuff. And then sometimes we do things that are really embarrassing. That's one of them. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm out there to solve these kind of embarrassing things. Yeah, and so for the upgrading the operating system, you don't need to reboot. It doesn't preclude doing different types of updates live. Um, and it, it'd actually be an interesting area of research, but I, I want to optimize, optimize on top of a safe system first, basically. So, yeah, oh, I guess one thing I didn't say is, of course, in this model, yeah, the upgrades are fully atomic. So if you've used Windows or the PlayStation 3, they'll have a little dialog that says, please don't turn off your computer. There's no equivalent of that on my system. You can pull the power at any point, and you either have the old system or the new. And in fact, you can reboot into either. So that's been very important to me. Um, let me actually do a demo. This is going to this is going to be a kind of lame demo. But um, if I'm just doing a listing of my uh, root directory, so there's a bunch of stuff in here. Um, but actually, ignore this part. Pretend there's just a slash os tree. I have symbolic links for different versions. It's not good. Um, but so, yeah, you can see in the root partition of my hard drive, um, there's this OS tree directory, and I have a separate Etsy from the distributions, from the one in the actual slash. I have a separate slash var, so the log files are all separate, because, yeah, I don't want to affect the host distribution. Um, right now, one details, I'm using the host kernel, because if <coughs> I'm building my own kernel, that exposes me to a lot, well, it's a lot of responsibility. You know, for example, if there's a file system, ext4 file system corruption thing, I mean, I don't want to take that kind of responsibility yet, so, um, and in fact, the Fedora kernel people are very good, so I'm just trying to replace all of user space, that's all. 
Um, so yeah, we're using the host kernel, and the actual interesting stuff is in uh, this slash trees directory. So my system is like Git in that each each uh, tree is identified by a checksum, and these are different checkouts, uh, and this is their checksum. So if I actually look at one of these, um, these are, if I look at its user bin, one thing you can see here from ls, it's telling me these things have a hard link of 10, which if you could see I had 10 operating system checkouts, so all this data is shared between the different routes. It's a classic Unix thing, it's just no one really had tried to quite use it for an upgrade system like this. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a kind of low-level detail of how everything works. And you just boot into a, a change route, and it's pretty much that simple. Um, but it is a, uh, a versioning file system. So I can do something like this. Um, oh, oops. If I could spell. OK, yeah, I actually have to fetch its parent. Um, yeah. Let's see. So yeah, this is actually how you do an upgrade. So I'm downloading the latest version of GNOME now. Uh, yeah, I was going to do a demo of the. Basically, you can browse the history of the file system. You can say, okay, what changed in this build? What changed in this build? So if you're doing something like trying to debug why your sound broke, you can say, okay, it turns out that this libatomic operations thing that Pulse Audio depends on changed. Kind of a culprit, right? Um, yeah, let's see. So I just downloaded some stuff. Yeah, okay. So in the last uh, build, uh, it was just GStreamer that changed. Actually, those guys commit all day, every day. It's crazy. <laughs> there, it's, yeah. But, but let me show you. So this is just a build log. But you have to understand, I've been trying for many years to write a continuous integration system for targeted for like the core of the operating system. And I tried to do it on top of packages twice, and I failed twice for different reasons. Um, so this is just a build log, but I am so proud of this because it's completely unattended. I went on vacation for a week, and people were committing stuff in GNOME, and it still worked. I didn't have to change a thing. And uh, yeah, you can see you can see here that it was actually the GStreamer people made a change. Yeah, it's it's not yeah, this is not that easy to demo, but. Hopefully, hopefully the ideas come through. You you mentioned um, before something about the not touching the, the distribution OS. So right. exactly what is the setup here? You have you have a separate yeah. original install yeah. plus a bunch of cheroots. Yeah, that's what it, yeah that's what I was trying to describe with this song. This is just an ls of slash, and um, this is all the distribution stuff. And then I just have a slash os tree directory, and everything's inside there. The technical way it's implemented is. Um, so the kernel boots, and then it starts the init, init ramfs, and I just have a modified drakeit that knows how to boot into this, and okay. it sets up a couple of bind mounts. Um, I mean, I could reboot into it, but all you'd see is GNOME without applications, because my system doesn't do applications, and we're still trying to figure that out. But, yeah, so in the big picture, all that I've really accomplished is that if you want to see the latest GNOME, and right now you aren't actually able to join wireless networks because I haven't figured out the Etsy thing exactly. Um, you can at least see it. And it's a fair amount to download, but the cool thing is that you can just pull and keep up with it. Yeah. Did you look at Nix at all? I have, yes. I spent, of course, a long time studying <coughs> what other people have done in this area before deciding to write my own wrapper for Make. So Nix is cool, very influential, because they solved the atomic upgrades thing. Now, the technical details of how the Nix store works, um, basically, it doesn't deduplicate by default. So when I look, the first thing I looked at this, and I was like, OK, so you, you have a 4 gigabyte OS or something like that. And you do an upgrade, and you potentially have another 4 gigabytes. That's kind of lame, right? So Nix uses checksum. How to describe it? The, the thing that really makes Nix kind of impractical is that they force a rebuild of everything whenever a dependency changes. So concretely, if you had to update uh, the C library for a security flaw, the entire world would need to be rebuilt because they do checksums based on the package inputs, which is cool in that it, it's pure, but there's just no way you could, I mean, you can't rebuild the world every time loopsy changes. I mean, it's just, 
it's not practical, is, is my conclusion. Actually, I, when I talked to them, they didn't quite disagree, but yeah. Very influential for me, though. They, there are some smart people, definitely, and I, I actually credit them. I'm, I have a web page for this project, which is, which is this. Um, What's the name of that other project? Nix. Yeah, nix. Okay. Nixos.org. It's linked from here too, actually. And I, yeah, I kind of mentioned, mentioned this. So, I guess one thing I should also say is I'm not, I'm not exactly trying to replace the entire idea of packages. So you can actually build a bunch of RPMs in any form you want, and then put them into one of these trees. So I kind of intentionally didn't tie my build system to the deployment system, if that makes sense. So, and it's something I'd like to experiment with is, you know, like a modified version of yum or something like that, that instead of actually affecting your root partition, does it in an OS tree look aside. Uh, I just, there's so much to do and I just haven't done yet, but that's, that's worth mentioning though. Are there any other questions? If you had a file system like ZFS or Dragonfly's Hammer, would you, I mean, a lot, a lot of this rollback stuff seems like it should be the job of yep. your actual file system, not this kind of, yeah. So that was obviously something that I spent a good amount of time looking at. Um, and Sun is doing something kind of like this with Solaris. They're integrating ZFS and the IPS package system type thing. The core problem, though, is so you can have a ButterFS file system for your Slash, right? That's easy. And you can take a snapshot of it. But the problem is that RPM doesn't know about it. So, for example, if you have your home on this ButterFS thing, well, if you roll back, you're going to lose all your home directory data, too. So it really starts taking you down this path of, okay, well, i got to target exactly the OS files to make it roll back just that. And that's the hard problem. For example, var. You don't want to roll back all your log messages, either, right? Because that might be useful to bugging data. Your virtual machine images, currently the libvirt default, so they live in very lib libvirt. You also probably want to be able to share configuration between the two. The question of whether something should be implemented in the kernel or user space is kind of, it's, it's an interesting, they have different advantages, but the nice thing about my system is that it's just assembling hard links. It's just as fast as the kernel file system. So, unfortunately, actually, if you use ButterFS, my system's kind of slower because the way it stores hard links is not as efficient as the XT4. Um, but yeah, that's a, you can you can easily take a whole disk snapshot with ButterFS. It works well, but it's hard to limit the scope. Is basically the answer. Um, there's a there's a good wiki page for the Fedora. Um, yeah, like to some experiments, Chris Ball and some other people do with ButterFS. But yeah, it's kind of hampered by this because you need to have an ex the exact partition layout. That makes sense. You need to have var and room and all these things in separate partitions. So yeah. I mean, it's totally doable. I just um, the other thing actually that kind of blocked me from depending on ButterFS. There's um there's a separate group in GNOME that was kind of doing some something like this based on ButterFS. Um, but the problem is I actually I work on many different versions of operating systems. Like I clearly can't just use this system. I have to work. I work on Fedora. I work on Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And it'd be really painful if I had to switch to ButterFS for my Red Hat Enterprise Linux systems too. Like I actually, yeah, I have a workstation that's running Red Hat Enterprise Linux 6, but I have this installed and it works fine, which is some, a property I really like to preserve, if that makes sense, so. Um, you talked before about actually working on the, the system and modifying it, but you also spoke of having a build server. Exactly what can you do on the client system versus the build server? Right, right. So this is actually a very interesting discussion for people who know about build systems. So, my system supports two things. First, you can rebuild everything from scratch. And I mean literally everything. Because I'm using this cross-build system, Yocto, which bootstraps from the host. So it uses your host GCC and libc to build a new GCC, etc. And that's a well-defined process. And in fact, I've actually been working on moving, like automating this in EC2 a little bit. Turns out it costs about $7 in on an EC2 medium one instance to rebuild everything from scratch right now. From scratch, right? So when you say everything, what do you mean by everything? Okay. <clears throat> this is a really good question. So um, 
Um, let me see here. So I'm really proud of this file. It's just some JSON, but this is kind of my package equivalent. And it's really just a list of Git repositories to build in order. It's very simple, actually, but it's been incredibly reliable. List of Git repositories to build in order turns out to be a huge, um, and I'm trying to work with the X people to eliminate that patch. But uh, yeah, so you can see here, it's actually pretty small. Like for most of them, I just say, OK, here's this one Git repository I know. And implicitly, it's tracking the master. So I have a lot of Git repositories in here, around 200. But that's mostly because of XOR. Like every single protocol is a separate Git repository because I don't know, they're crazy. Um, and then the other system is uh, Yocto. So that's, and your, that's your JH build one? That's my JH build equivalent, yeah. yeah. So there's no, yeah, there's no build dependencies or anything like that. It's just things to build those for one. The, um, the, the Yocto thing, though, so remember when I said back a little bit ago that it's not the technology that's important in a lot of cases, it's the people behind it. Intel, it turns out, pays a lot of people to work on this Yocto system um, because they want people to make devices that include Intel chips and uh, they have a lot of competent people. And so I use it for that, mostly because the people are really good. It's, it's kind of lame in a couple ways, but um, basically, yeah, this is, this is the bootstrap system. And yeah, I mean, it's not really worth going into too much detail. But so for example, I'm building libjpeg inside this. And that's a well-defined process. I'm not building it from Git because I don't think they even use Git. One detail is I have imported a bunch of things into Git because my system only accepts that. So, yeah. Is there some way that, uh, you know, that it sounds, sounds like you have to have that, those things build in order, and if you put something in the wrong place, it won't build. That's right. And uh, that sounds like a genuine nightmare. No, out. no, it's actually been t the total opposite. Like my experience in the last time, <laughs> the last time I tried to write a continuous integration system on top of packages, like this problem of the metadata being out of sync, you know, a, a small new build dependency got added. My system's not as pure in that it may have too much in the build root. It's true, but simply ha like eliminating metadata has let me go on vacation for a week and not have to touch it. If that makes sense. Like I kind of aggressively deduplicated the entire system. Um, like, so for example, if something doesn't build like the auto tools, for those of you who don't know, it's basically the configure, make, make, install stuff, I patch it to do so. And I maintain that patch. I don't put the build rules inside the metadata. So yeah, there's no executable code inside, um, inside this thing. It's just pure metadata. And it's, it's really, it's worked the best. That of anything I've ever written, and I tried something like what you're talking about, and I had to babysit it. It just wasn't practical. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, do you, for the buy section that you're talking about, uh, that users could, could do themselves in order to track down problems? Yep. Um, is it necessary to actually reboot? Could you do like the thing that, that Daniel Baron Day was talking about with the human pass through You're talking about with what, sir? Uh, it was something Daniel Baron Day was working on. Okay. Um, with, where he was, he, was talking, he was trying to send back applications. And he was using uh, Kimu's um, 9P uh, protocol to pass through. Right. Um, oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Oh, right. Can you use virtual machines to, to do the bisection? Absolutely. Down. Absolutely, and that's actually a use case. I'm starting to get to my dream workflow, which is like I have a bunch of Git repositories. I modify three of them, boot that in QMU, and run the tests. It's like I've been wanting this for so many years. You have no idea. And I'm almost getting there. So yes, once you have the file system tree, I actually have some scripts that put it in a QMU disk and will help you boot it. So yeah, you could do the bisection that way. But the problem is, is that virtual machines are not the same as real machines. So it's actually kind of unfortunate because but if your abstractions are right, then they are the same. Well, I, I if, think it's a failure of abstractions. Okay, let me, let me give you a good example. When we were trying to roll out Pulse Audio, right, it turned out that a lot of the Linux audio drivers didn't expose the right timing data. Now, before when you were using the old sound system, this didn't matter because it was kind of inefficient and only one app could use it at a time. Pulse tried to drive it, but the point is that to debug um, this sort of thing, if you really, you need native hardware. There's a lot sure. that you need native hardware for. And for GNOME, if you boot in a virtual machine, you're going to be using software rendering. Totally different thing. Yeah, totally okay. different, right? So it matters a lot to me to be able to boot natively. If, 
virtual machines solve most people's problems, though. It's just kind of. I mean, the question, though, then, is how do you update it, right? Which my system also handles atomically. Sure. Yeah. Remember that, that, that distribution? I forgot its name. That, that always had you building packages. What was that? And so, right. So what what are you saying is the, the, the difference between that kind of attitude and what you're trying to build? Okay, that's a great question. So yes. Or BSD. Um, wait, what? Or, or BSD. Or Linux. Right, right. BSD has some make world type things. <coughs> First though. Correct as well. Right, right. So but remember though, okay, there's two things. First, in my system it does you can have multiple operating systems installed. Gen 2 doesn't have this. When you're building, it's affecting your host system. Um, and you'll see people, I think there was some commenter in LWN. It's actually really crazy what goes on when you're running a package manager inside a terminal in your desktop. Because like the package manager, which is connected via input and output to the terminal, is like removing files. And you could very easily ha happen that it crashes the terminal, in which case the package manager just dies in the middle. It's like this horrible, it, yeah, it makes no sense. So they don't solve that problem, and I do, basically, is that updates are fully atomic. Um, and the second thing is there's different, I have a very different culture than Gentoo. Gentoo is more about choice. You know, say, okay, I want to rebuild all of everything with uh, dash dash, um, you know, 05 or something, right? Or F omit frame pointer or whatever. <coughs> I am, I hold no embarrassment in saying I'm trying to deliver less choice, but higher quality. And I believe that I can do that. Basically, so, and I'm actually not trying to replace distributions as is, but because there, I'm not, I don't plan to expand this to something like a whole world of packages. I only want to say, okay, here's GNOME, you know, you can install apps, and I'll make that really good. I will make sure if it breaks, we fix it, basically. And I'm not scoping out from there. Does that make sense? I mean, at the end of the day, are you, you know, it sounds like you're not trying to build a package manager or anything like that. You're really trying to build a way to re, you know, to basically run, you know, latest or some version nearby of GNOME so that people can try it, test it, and, right. and roll back from it. So that's, that's right. That is, that is a use case that I feel hasn't been filled by packages. Um, yes. But, I mean, I do have higher ambitions than that, though. Um, so... The reason packages exist is to generate use cases, right? So you might have you know, a default system that has no, um, or you can have a much more complicated case where you have a server type install, but you want to use GNOME to manage it. And there are actually a lot of really hard problems in, in generating these sorts of cases. Like one of the things that makes me angry in Fedora right now is um, right now when you plug in a network cable, nothing happens. And the reason for that is because the server people won and said, when you plug in a network cable, nothing should happen on a server. And we don't have any method to distinguish between these. They're just packages that you install. Uh, yeah, it, it embarrasses me when I see that, but we have bigger problems. But the point is that the packages generate use cases. And my system is more identify targeted use cases. So like as an example, um, if you saw in a slash OS tree, uh, there is a uh, devel. So, I have, I'm basically generating two file system trees right now. One is just a client. It's what you would need to use you know, the system and install apps. And the other is it comes with all the development tools. And rather than having a bunch of different parts that get assembled, I say, okay, here are the two use cases, and I name them. You know, I say, these are the two use cases I want to support. It's, it's a question of emphasis, and I would like to get to a higher scope, but I mean, it's certainly going to be one of the problems as the system evolves is in order to use it well let's say you want to use Java or something like that I'm not building Java right now if you want to use it you reboot to your distribution and I have no problem with that because it's not something I'm trying to enable so it's complicated <laughs> but I am I am more ambitious than just trying the latest like I would really love if some of the technology ideas filtered down in the distributions like Ubuntu and Fedora specifically if I can get to the point where I can have a modified yum that installs these Trees, that would be a good, it's complicated to do though, for a variety of reasons, but yeah, we'll see. Yeah, I, I'm wondering if um, something like your base system could be used to support both 32 and 64 bits, 
OS installations in the same machine. Yeah, in fact, I yeah, mean, it's, that, that, I, I would actually appreciate something like that. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm only building 32-bit right now, but I mean, I could build 64-bit. The awesome thing, of course, is that when you do do this, because of the way identical files are hard linked, you, the, my equivalent of no arch packages just happens automatically. Like, you, they just share space. That's it. Right. Identical files share storage. So yeah, you can parallel install 32 and 64. How am I doing on time, actually? Oh, well, you're doing fine. OK. Yeah. 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 Give it about this, another half hour oh, wow. for one. <laughs> Does this require uh, bundles, application bundles? Um, how applications should work is really up in the air. I mean, you could certainly, you can certainly install applications that come in RPMs on top of my system now. If you just RPM dash dash no adapt Firefox, it'll probably work. But the bundling thing is complicated. I don't really want to encourage a model where applications bundle everything, but I don't, but I don't think you can block on having everything inside a distribution. It's a tension that I'm not, there's no real solution for it. But I do think it's important to enable third parties to build applications that don't come in distributions. Um, I mean, this has actually been a tension in the free software community for a long time. You know, to what degree do we enable proprietary software? Um, and I'm very much on the side, I mean, I only run free software, but I don't, there are valid use cases for installing proprietary software through an external mechanism. Like a concrete example, right, Google Chrome. It, they make RPMs. Now, one f big flaw with this is that each RPM can own your system because they include shell scripts that run as root. That's wrong. That's just wrong. Like, uh, installing apps should not require root, and it should not be giving Google, for example, on a lockdown IT device where they don't even have root, it makes sense to go install apps per user. So that's the kind of thing that I'd like to enable. We haven't figured that out, and I actually just commented on LWN about this too. There's a lot of systems in the past that have failed that have tried to do this, and it's very hard, but it, it makes sense. It's a valid use case. We just don't enable it. Um, yeah. Mostly, actually, because of OH Drepper optimizing libc. Basically, whenever you build against the newest version of libc, it opts you in to all the newest symbols, and it just forces you to run on the latest, and it's really annoying. He basically raised this, but yes, I do want to allow installing applications. Yeah. All right. Any, anything else? Anything I can, that makes sense. Yep. Um, but yeah, let me just finish and say the system as is now is mainly for hardcore developers. So, I mean, eventually I'd like it for people to use it to tr see the latest GNOME and help give us feedback, which actually is something I didn't talk about. The feedback cycle with Bugzilla just sucks, but one thing at a time. Um, but yeah, so it's for developers now. But I just want to let you guys know that we're working on improving quality, or at least I am. It's pretty much just me. Although other people are trying. But yeah, it's coming. And hopefully some of the ideas will filter in the distributions and stuff. So. Cool. I think that's it. Okay, thank you very much, Colin.